My name is John Passfield, and the title of this reading will be The Poetic Novel 1, Video 12, The Modernist Lyric. So here is the book that I'm going to read from. Oops, The Poetic Novel 1, Influences and Elements, by John Passfield. Um, it's not a published book, meaning you can't buy the physical copy, but can be accessed for free on my website, johnpassfield.ca. Just click on the icon and the text will appear. The essay that I'm going to read from has eight sections, but in this video, I'm going to read from the first two sections, then read part of the final section as a conclusion, just to give you the flavor of the essay. The complete essay, as I mentioned, can be found on my website, johnpassfield.ca, J-O-H-N-P-A-S-S-F-I-E-L-D.ca. Okay, so... Note 12, it's the 12th essay, The Modernist Lyric by Graham Huff, H-O-U-G-H. I keep a copy of a book of essays, Modernism, A Guide to European Literature, 1890-1930, in my car, and read it when my wife is shopping. I have read every chapter a number of times since I bought the book in May 2011. I have studied this book along with modern or modernist novels, theory and criticism because I felt from the beginning of my novel writing career that I was going back to the moderns, modernists and building my novels on what I found in them to be of value. However, I have never felt that I was in complete accord with either their ideas or their techniques. I felt that I was drawing on the moderns, the modernists, as the most congenial body of writers and works, poetry, poetic theory, and poetic novels, for the working out of a form-meaning pattern for the poetic novel for myself and for my time. So all of the quotations in this note are from the essay, The Modernist Lyric, by Graham Huff, H-O-U-G-H. So here's the first quotation by Graham Huff. Poetry can no longer be derived as that of most previous poetical schools had been from a single cultural stream. The poet has all the myths of, of the world available to him, which also means that he has none. The poet is made, left to make his own myth or to select, whoops, turn two pages here instead of one, or to select, one, by an arbitrary choice from the vast uncodified museum, the limitless junk shop of the past. So, in the past, he says, each society had one myth, and the writers uh, wrote based on that myth. Now, we have a junk shop of uh, beat up, broken, fragmented old myths to choose from. The best poets place their emphasis, this is, that was his quote. Okay, here's me responding to that. The best poets place their emphasis on cultural experience rather than cultural ideas. This is me speaking here. Shakespeare exasperated critics like T.S. Eliot because in the balance of cultural experience and cultural ideas, Shakespeare gave the most emphasis to cultural experience. The experience of living day to day, not the theories in the books. Dante, on the other hand, was a T.S. Eliot favorite because Dante gave the balance to cultural ideas, to the words in the books, the ideas in the books, even to the point that he could be seen as simply putting into poetry what his culture, at least the thought leaders of his culture, the explicators of medieval Christianity, had already put into prose in their theological works. When I was studying Chaucer, as I was writing my novel, Geoffrey Chaucer, Canterbury Bound. Here it is, Geoffrey Chaucer, Canterbury Bound, a novel by John Passfield. I bridled at the idea that Chaucer was poeticizing the ideas of his society as contained in the prose polemics of such writers as Boethius. My bias in reading Chaucer was to assume that he was writing with great awareness of the ideas of Christianity, but was balancing that body of thought in favor of the life experience of himself and the people of his time within a Christian society idea frame 
as he had observed and understood the ideas experience interaction. With Christian theology and daily experience, each has the measuring stick of the validity and value of the other. So you can simply parrot uh, ideas in literature, or you can say, well, I let the ideas and the experience bounce off each other, and they can measure each other for validity and value, right? Does my experience bear out the ideas? Do the ideas illuminate my experience? So Chaucer and Shakespeare on the one hand, Dante and T.S. Eliot on the other. Would any of us say that the Canterbury Tales is a Christian poem? Would any of us say that the Canterbury Tales is an anti-Christian or even a non-Christian poem? Is it not all of these at the same time? sliding back and forth on scales like the ideal on the one side and the actual on the other, and other similar polarities. Would any one of us say that Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are pro-war poems? Would any one of us say that Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are anti-war or non-war poems? Again, I would say that they are all of these and range back and forth in episodes and imagery between various ideal and actual polarity. So you have the ideal of the theories, and you have the reality of the experience or the action, and the book shows you one illuminating, one bouncing off the other. Likewise with Shakespeare, was he a Christian or a non-Christian or an anti-Christian author? Was he a chauvinistic or an anti-chauvinistic author? Was he a monarchist or an anti-monarchist? Was he a pro-male or pro-female author? The greatest authors are living their daily lives inside the parameters of the societal myths of their times and societies on the one hand and thinking outside those same societal myths at the same time. So they weren't captives of the ideas of their time, but they were certainly aware of them. They were also able to stand outside them and look at them. That's the point there. That the current societal myth for many people is that there are no societal myths makes this a very interesting time, 2023 as I'm reading this, to be alive. Of course, there's always myths, patterns of meaning into which to fit the events and information of our experiences in order to make sense of them. I'm going to read that again. That's a definition of myth. And there's always myths. Patterns of meaning into which to fit the events and information of our experiences in order to make sense of them. And our age just happens to have many more myths than earlier ages. What we have actually is myths on topics which claim to cover all of life, but no single myth which has the general adherence of the controllers of our world, the elites above us, or the general adherence of the majority of the people on the ground, the common folk below. So writers of today are not responding pro-con or pro and con to a general myth of our time, whether in total adherence, as Eliot's assumption about Dante, or in a balance, as with Shakespeare and Homer, but are writing about selective myths. So when you don't have one major societal myth, as we used to have in the Christian society of the Middle Ages, or as, say, communism had before the Iron Curtain fell, then you select from among the many myths, right? Selective myths purport to deal with all of society. So whatever myth a writer selects, he says, oh, this covers every human experience. But in the hands of lesser writers, these myths become not comprehensive, but polemical. They're pushing a narrow idea. Likewise, much literary criticism assumes and promotes not comprehensiveness, but polemic, pushes narrow ideas. Much of the debate about Conrad's Heart of Darkness is based on the assumption that writers should be polemical, and that Conrad presumably is polemical, and the question becomes, which side is he on? If the topic is colonialism, a Conrad critic assumes that Conrad must either be pro-colonial or anti-colonial and is frustrated that the text of Heart of Darkness does not fall easily into one of these camps. Some see Conrad as colonial and some see see him as anti-colonial. Some see Conrad as racist and some see him as anti-racist. How many see Conrad 
as rating on a level of human experience, human perception, and human communication wherein the white men are not white men and the black men are not black men in that novel and the English are not English and the Romans are not Romans. In great literature, the ostensible topic, colonialism, racism, and so on, is never the actual topic. Experience, perception, communication. Heart of Darkness is about all peoples at all times, and hence it is a book which is both in praise of and in condemnation of the response to experience in terms of perception and communication of every human being who's ever lived, is living, and will live. So the great books are in praise of and are highly critical of every human being who's ever lived or ever will live. They're not taking sides among the various groups of humans. They're talking about every human and how we respond to our life here on this planet. It is on that level of experience, excuse me, <clears throat> to the human condition and experience that the best writers pitch their literary works. As readers, we can either appreciate them on that level or bring them down to a lower level of discourse by praising or condemning them for promoting or rejecting one side of the chosen politic polemical issue of our choice. Now, <clears throat> excuse me again, raw throat. The essay goes on for six more sections. If this is your kind of thinking, it's not for everyone, and have a look at johnpaswell.ca. Here is part of the concluding section to that essay. The great historical crises of thought have not been crises at all for the most creative writers. They have only been crises for derivative writers. When I asked my uncle whether his family was homesick for his birth land of England, he said, we never had time to be homesick. Mother Courage, the character in the Brecht play, Mother Courage, would say the same if you asked her whether she was suffering a mental crisis because the philosophical foundations of civilized society were crumbling around her. Her reply might be, I have never had time for mental crisis. While at the level of ancestral memory, her mind might sigh, when in history has the simultaneous building and crumbling of idea structures not been the case? So if these writers think they're living in an exceptional era, hey, ideas are always being built up. Ideas are always being torn down. And people like Mother Courage, who just lives day to day, knows that. The greatest writers have responded to the shifting balances of chaos and stability in their times from the beginnings of spoken word and written word civilization. When did they ever feel that the official myth of their times was exactly in line with their own and their fellow humans' experience of life in their societies and on this earth? And does history not show the acceptance and rejection of societal myth to be on a sliding scale from historical time to historical time, from society to society, and from person to person within those times and those societies. So we are always accepting and rejecting these societal myths that everybody pretends we all agree with 100%. The shallowest people of their societies were echoing their societal myths or rejecting their societal myths, but the deepest people of their societies the Shakespeare's, the Beethoven's, the Einstein's were not echoing societal myths. They were creating personal societal myths out of what they saw as usable fragments of societal myths and measuring those fragments against the realities of their on-the-ground experience. So they were always aware of these myths, but they were always evaluating these myths and adjusting them in their own minds. And now... So that's the end of that essay. And now here's a note that I wrote while rereading this essay for this video presentation. Serious literature is a response to the human experience of living here on the earth at the most basic level of thought and emotion. That writers who live in a certain era 
sometimes think of their era as not ideal for the production of serious literature as rather strange. I don't think there's any era in which serious literature has been written which does not, at the deepest level, resemble our own era. That we have both chaos and stability, that we have both war and peace, that we have both hopes and fears, that we have both triumphs and failures, that we have both groups and individuals, all means that we are living our own unique version of the eternal experience of what it is to be human. We have literary eras because literature is always struggling to find a contemporary way to respond to universal and eternal experience. In some areas, literature, in some eras, sorry, literature loses its way. It produces works which are somehow too superficial to be considered as great literature, too shallow to be considered as anything more than entertainment. In other eras, the era of Homer, the era of the great Greek playwrights, the era of Marlowe and Shakespeare, and a number of eras since then, including the era of the early 20th century, the modernist era, literature has found a way to get in touch with what is most essential in the human experience and express that response in forms that speak to readers. That social cataclysms cause writers to search for new forms and that sometimes writers are not successful in finding these forms is very true. In our own era, writers are searching for forms which will allow them to capture both the uniqueness of our era and its similarity to those that have preceded ours. Only time will tell whether they will be successful. So, this is my book. The Poetic Novel One, Influences and Elements by John Passfield. As I said before, you can access it for free just by going to my website, johnpassfield.ca, and clicking on the icon. So lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.